Welcome to the uh, last session of the day and uh, hopefully you're all uh, tired enough and sleepy enough and uh, comfortable enough to uh, not pay attention. Um, <laughs> we're going to try, um, I'm going to try something different. Okay, we're going to try something different. But having seen some of the previous presentations, um, it actually works very nicely, especially after Anthony's presentation on um, the good way of being pedantic about terms, right? What, what I wanted to try uh, today is uh, focus on this idea of device management as a platform or basically how to adopt a platform model um, going forward um, in managing our devices, considering all the changes that we have been seeing and, and hearing about, uh, especially today. And the idea is that we, we go through the why, what and how uh, process, which I think is something similar to uh, the Shopify presentation that I think Diana did earlier. So um, uh, thankfully, this isn't completely irrelevant to what, what we have seen so far. And it will make sense. Now, um, who's up for some information systems theory? Excellent. There's one hand. Excellent. OK. So um, I, th there are lots of familiar faces, which is great. Uh, for those who uh, I haven't seen before, my name is Yanis. Ignore the surname if it's, if it's too difficult, uh, as all Greek surnames are. I'm the Apple System Specialist at the London School of Economics. Um, uh, I've been there for about four years and my role there is to uh, manage the uh, what we call the enterprise Apple environment. So um, the infrastructure uh, framework for the management of our devices and work with our support teams both internal within IT as well as external in providing a managed environment. We have uh, a few thousand devices and we have been growing over the last four years. Uh, the agenda really is fairly straightforward. Right? We are going to focus on these three questions. Why, what, and how, and specifically why we should consider the platform approach. And um, deconstructing the forces that are currently ongoing, um, we're going to start very broad and narrow down as we go towards the end. Okay? So we're going to start with, with pure sort of academically, academically minded information systems theory to understand the why bit that will then help us to move on to the, the what bit, which is, you know, what is a platform? It's a term that we, we hear on, on a daily basis these days, certainly within IT. Um, but a platform is a term that is used quite loosely. Nevertheless, it has fairly defined dimensions. And we're going to look at some of the basics because we only have 45 minutes and I can go on about this sort of stuff. Um, and I'll try not to. Um, and then the idea is that after that, we will become even narrower uh, in our focus and, and start talking about how we can design, how we can use basic design principles that are already being developed in other, other fields from information systems, computer science, all the way to economics, that in a way that they apply to what it is we do. And hopefully, no, I promise it will make sense in the end. Okay, the, the last bit will be more about device management, having gone through the, the, you know, the process of understanding everything. Um, this presentation is, 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 is done in the spirit of you know, the LSE motto, which is to, to know the causes of things. That's the first half. The other half is for the betterment of society, but really, you know, IT is, is good enough for us uh, uh, today. Uh, and the first question, which is why choose the platform model? Um, really, it, it comes down to, to a number of changes that, that we are bo seen both in the IT sphere, specifically in the, in the Apple landscape, a change in Apple landscape, and we've talked uh, enough about this today uh, to be able to, to understand this bit, but as well as um, on the outside of IT, you know, in the social sphere, we have, we have this, these you know, digitally social um, computer uh, users, that they're no longer computer users, they're basically digitally social workers, uh, and, and how all that feeds into this idea of a platform. So a new type of user. Okay, what, what do we mean by that? Um, this is, um, I have a few book and, and kind of paper references, by the way, because um, it makes me look smarter than I am, right? Because other people said this and I just repeat it. So this is, this is fairly profound uh, as, a, as a statement. Um, making the web social, which is something that we have seen over the last 10, 12 years, um, means that we have moved onto a state of, of technical sociality, right? People, people don't distinguish between using a computer to you know, do work and using it to, I don't know, connect with their families or order their groceries and, and so on. And the web is social. Now, whether it's in the context of work or, or outside the context of work, uh, you can't escape it. You can, um, I mean, these are examples of, of platforms, effectively, 
that are inherently social but are also used for work. Right? You can't really avoid thinking about how do I share data within an organization in a social way. Um, I think, um, uh, again, going back to the Shopify presentation, the gamification of implementing a new system or the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of game approach um, is a social um, um, construct. Um, another important thing, the new device form factors. You know, the iPhone has been transformational. And if you're you know, above a certain age, you remember what it was like before the iPhone was around and what work was like before the iPhone was around. Right? You had to sit in front of a computer to log into a system to access email or launch an application to access email, which of course we still do. But you know, looking at everyone looking at their phones at the minute, we're doing two things at the same time. We're being social and we're working. Working. Um, right, the new users, and I'm, I'm, I see a lot of 20-year-olds. Uh, okay, I, I work in a university. I'm also involved with the academic side of things a bit. Um, I, I chose Snapchat. Because I'm sorry, but I, I still can't really engage. I understand the principle, but th it has no use for me. It has no function. Nevertheless, for a 19-year-old or even a 15-year-old, this is, in some cases, where they spend most of their time. When they become 25-year-olds or 35-year-olds, they will have moved on, obviously, but the principle stays the same. And it's those sort of, sort of people that we will be managing devices, although I believe that's eventually going to disappear, the idea of we m us managing a device altogether. Um, and we have to keep that in mind. I know this is looking, you know, 10 years into the future, but still. And computers are not just for work anymore. I mean, one example is, is the iPhones here, but this is, uh, you know, as the, uh, this picture from the French Parliament uh, <laughs> very neatly illustrates. And this was apparently, um, according to the website I got this from, this was apparently during a vote for uh, uh, same-sex marriages in France. Now, it could be that these guys are just not interested, right? That's how we would read it. It could be that this was during a break. And all they did on the same interface is changed from working to, you know, taking a break, using their computer, not just for work. So that's one, one of the, you know, I, what, what I believe to be one of the driving forces of why we should be looking at this sort of stuff. The other one is, is something that we've certainly talked about enough today. Uh, but, you know, it's a discussion that we will continue having. Uh, it's the shifting landscape for us. Um, w this is nothing new, okay? We've seen these, I think these icons have probably been in pretty much every presentation today. We have MDM, it's been around for now nearly a decade, just after the introduction of the iPhone. Um, we have uh, programs like VPP, DP, platform-based uh, services that we use. Someone else created them, someone else controls them. And we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about ownership and value. Uh, as we go uh, forward, but we use them a lot and they have changed the way that we do things. Um, one example that, again, has been mentioned all the time that I think encapsulates perfectly all of this is the iMac Pro, right? Um, amazing piece of uh, engineering, uh, costs as much as if you spec it up as a you know, mid-range BMW, but uh, <laughs> the innovation is not just in the hardware, the innovation as in the new way, the, the, the implementation of a new way of doing things with existing materials, let's say, um, is also in the way that it affects us. Uh, we have things like Secure Boot that everyone loves, yeah? Okay. No imaging that everyone loves. Uh, trusted Mac OS coming. We don't really know exactly how that's going to play out. Uh, user approved MDM that everyone loves. I think you, s you see where I'm going, going with this, right? Uh, kernel extension loading is the same thing. Now, what, what are Apple saying? Apple basically say, oh, it's fine, just, you know, here. Use DEP. It's all going to go away. We know it's not as simple as that. Uh, but that's it. That's reality. It's today. This is from earlier today. You know, this is something that really, um, not worries us, but, you know, it's something that we, <laughs> we, we want to explore more. Um, I, I did, a, yeah, this is just my uh, counting, but out of the 13 presentations on the schedule today, I sort of identified eight as being related to this sort of topic of the change in landscape. The other one, and now we're going to start getting a bit theoretical, right? So stay with me. Uh, this is a good time for uh, the way innovations diffuse and ultimately get replaced. Um, and we're going to use some information systems theory that uh, specifically the diffusion of innovations here. And well, what does that say? It's a simple thing, right? What, what it says is the way a new technology or a new you know, innovation um, 
is introduced into the workplace or into society in general is uh, it follows a certain process. At the beginning, you have innovators and early adopters. Eventually, as it gets used more, it reaches the stage of uh, an early majority that becomes a late majority as the technology uh, starts diffusing. So it's being overtaken by other things and eventually it fades out. So um, if we say, assume this is, you know, let's use the imaging versus DP example, right, which, which we've used a lot today. Uh, if we say this is imaging, I would argue we are now uh, at the later stage. It's still used extensively. People do image computers, uh, even though pretty much every session is about DEP. Um, so we're moving from late majority to you know, the, the laggard stage. Now, when, not if anymore, but when this gets overtaken by something like DEP, some sort of deployment uh, model that, that, that is DEP-like, it's not just going to continue on, right? It doesn't work like that. It's not a linear process. In fact, what happens is you have another curve that is happening at the same time. DP has been around since 2013. We are now at a different stage. And this is the interesting bit. This is why this now, is the, now is a good time and all of this confusion is actually a creative process because the creative stuff happens in this, in this space. And like I said, we're moving from one stage, you know, the late majority to the laggard stage for the old technology. But at the same time, we're now moving to uh, a stage, you know, the early adoption stage to the early majority stage where a technology becomes a lot more solid and stable for something like, you know, DP versus imaging. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, take this even further. Uh, w when we do a capability versus maturity uh, sort of analysis, um, what, what, what we've been told is that the optimum time for enterprise IT to adopt a new technology is not at the very beginning or at the very end. It's after the knee, the knee being this spot right there. And that's where, say, startups want to be. At the beginning, uh, the, early, the early stage of that graph is for research labs, innovation labs, you know, universities, academics. Um, later on, as you move up and the, the technology becomes more capable and more mature, it's for enterprise IT. Now, if we uh, take our favorite subjects, DP, MDM, and user-approved MDM, it becomes a bit more complicated, okay? Because we can argue that DP is now past that knee. It's mature enough, and it's now mainstream enough that it's been adopted. Um, MDM, more so. It's been around for, for a decade versus four years, whatever it is. Um, we manage our iPhones. Um, even before DP, we used MDM for that. So user-approved MDM, which is a different concept, it involves, you know, you, the U bit, uh, the U letter being very important here. Uh, well, actually, the U and the A. Uh, it brings the user into the process, right? We don't just deliver the technology, we, we co-create the value for the technology. Now, going forward, we have to draw a box around all of, the, all of these things, both, uh, all three things, and make them work. So we can't really wait for the orange circle to move all the way up to the graph. That's going to be a challenge. It will be interesting to see how, how that uh, uh, well, plays out. So just to summarize that first bit, we, we're moving from um, a situation where we have, uh, or, or a state where we have IT being delivered to users, to IT and IT, you know, value through IT being delivered with them, you know, created with them. Um, we're going from the IT department owning the technology stack to using someone else's technology. And again, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Who owns DEP? You know, who owns the implementation? Like me wiping this laptop now and going through the setup, it will go through an LSE system, but who owns it? Um, systems are no longer, no longer engineered for the most part. If you decide to go down that road, um, they're integrated. Right? We went 20 years ago, we were systems engineers. Then we became systems administrators. I argue systems integrators or something along those lines is coming, if not here already. And value. We're introducing value to this, and it's going to stay with us until the end, because value is important. The way that we deliver value through IT is important, because it, the, the old rules no longer apply. Okay, the value of the IT department to the business is no longer mandated by the organizational structure. In simpler words, just because you're the IT department, it doesn't mean that everyone in the business will do what you say. In some, in some cases, that still, the, you know, that still happens. 
highly regulated environments, uh, defense, uh, generally government, that's fine. But they tend to be the last ones to you know, play the game anyway. So the value of the IT department and the technology generally to the business is measured through user participation and acceptance. Again, I, I keep referring to this, but again, the Shopify uh, presentation, for those who saw it, was a very good example. It was actually the other half of this presentation. It's how you do all these things. So this is what I put forward to you, right? That in this changing landscape with the parameters I've just, I've just presented or the, you know, the, the changes that I've just presented to you, the ability to adapt and adopt uh, and embrace participation, value through participation is fundamental. And that's where adopting a platform approach can help. Now, you know, what is it? What, what is it we're talking about? What's a platform? Uh, obviously, it's where you go and, and you know, jump on a train. And it's a platform. I mean, it's not named like this for, you know, by accident. There's a reason. And we have all sorts of platforms. And, and you know, people will refer to many things as a platform. So what we want to do is we want to, we want to identify the specific characteristics of what is it that makes something a platform. And then, hopefully, pick these up and use them to design, you know, to do device management. So we have physical platforms that you know, act as brokers and facilitators. You go on the station, you, do, you, know, you go on the platform, you jump on the train. You're not going to stay there. You go there for a reason. Uh, we have um, uh, things like political platforms or activist platforms. Uh, this conference, uh, you know, user groups that enable and empower people. You can, you know, you can go in and, and say your piece, as it were. We have, we're moving into digital social platforms, we have platforms like Facebook that invite or even mandate participation. You can't be on Facebook and not participate. You're not producing any value, both for yourself, for other users, or the platform itself. Imagine if you were on Facebook and you never liked, followed, uh, you know, uh, made a comment. You, you're not producing data. You have no value. And then moving on to digital platforms, um, we have this new concept of value, like multi-sided value. And this is now where we're getting into economics theory. Uh, multi-sided markets are basically how our economy is running at the minute. You produce value on one with one hand and you, sorry, you consume with one hand and you produce with the other. And we're going to go into that in a bit more detail because that's, that's the, the tricky thing to, uh, to understand. Now, what's also interesting is that it doesn't matter how, which way you swap these around. They all apply, right? Both to the physical, the kind of human, social, digital, uh, um, they all apply. Uh, if I swap these around, a platform on a station still provides multi-sided value both to the train company, myself as the user, the station, the shops around the station, and so on. Because what it does is it facilitates and enables people to you know, walk in and go out. So we're just going to take a look at these characteristics and, and try and create this sort of context and framework that we can then apply and start narrowing down. And we're going to look at platforms as brokers and facilitators first. The, the, the train example is, 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 is perfect. Right? Platforms exist in between. They serve a purpose. They're not the destination. You came here today, you probably used you know, Leicester Square Station, but you didn't get on the train to go to Leicester Square Station. You got on the train to come here. So the platform was in between. And platforms are always in between. Uh, digital platforms effectively provide this, you know, th that's the solid ground idea. And Value is delivered through user participation. Again, this is important. Now, well-designed digital platforms, like the uh, Apple developer uh, platform, um, they strike a balance. Right? They, they produce value by um, basically enabling participation through a balance between being open and prescriptive or you know, restrictive at the same time. You can sign up to be a developer. You can develop an app. You have, you have that, that flexibility. You can do that. You're enabled to do that, but you have to abide by the rules. And then the other concept is participation and value. Um, and, and these two are contingent. They're, they're linked. You can't really have one, or one without the other in a platform. And to explain this, my favorite subject, Windows Mobile. Okay? Now, a misconception is that to generate value, you want features. Okay, the more features I provide, the more people will come, or you know, the better the platform will be. And that's not the case. It's actually participation that makes it. And we can deconstruct this, this, um, 
um, a piece of you know advertising from back when Windows Mobile you know things were getting better. Um, and, and see where it went wrong, right? What we have here is a bunch of features. They cover Apple, Android, there's a computer, there's a phone, the phone is on the cloud. The, that basically means you get better performance, and that means, you know, ultimately you save money, right? There's some, there was some marketing executive somewhere in Microsoft thinking, that's it, you know, we've done it, we've nailed it. But ultimately, things didn't get better because there were no users, and there were no users because there were no developers, and there were no developers because there were no users. And you see where this is going. And, you know, it went away. Um, Multi-sidedness uh, or, you know, multi-sided value is important. Facebook is a perfect example, right? Facebook is free and always will be, which is great for us, the users. But then why is it that, you know, Zuckerberg is a gazillionaire? How do they make the money? And of course, the answer is the money is uh, coming from advertising. Now, think about this. It's free for us. But the advertisers pay because of the data that the free users generate. So it provides value, both to me because I don't have to pay for it, but also to you know, whoever pays. And interestingly enough, I don't know if you can see those numbers because this isn't a good picture. Um, in, this is from 2015, last quarter. Right? Uh, a user in the US cost $13.54. A user in Europe cost $4.50. And uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, $1.59 per quarter. In uh, advertising revenue for the platform. I just find this really interesting. So this idea of multi-sidedness is what underpins another concept we're introducing now, which is the consumer as producers concept. And again, this, this, is, this is the difficult bit to understand when in the next section we come to design our you know, platform to manage devices. Um, so uh, something to understand, and, and it's, it's important to stress, is this isn't a technical thing. This isn't a technical problem. The technology is there. Um, what it requires us to do is have a different process, a different attitude towards how we do things. And some fundamentals. We need to be inclusive rather than prescriptive. Otherwise, things just don't work. Um, we aim, we, we, I, I believe we should aim for technological alignment with Apple. Actually, whether we like it or not now, I think we, you know, we, we, we're at the stage now where we realize we have to do this, otherwise there's this, this no going forward. Um, and to generate multi-directional multi value, both for us, the platform users, and so on, through uh, a new concept, generativity. So generative user participation, we're going to talk about generativity in a bit. Um, so you have the value of IT to the user, the value of IT to the business, the value of the user towards IT, and so on and so forth. Now, the good news is we are already doing some of it, some more than others. And, and we do this, like I said, um, almost uh, organically, with, without really understanding, necessarily understanding, or even knowing, or even caring about all of this. Um, just an example, we have consumers, producers. If we use, uh, if we consume, if we use Mac OS or uh, iOS, um, at the same time as an IT department, we are acting as producers by leveraging the services, the platforms that Apple provides us with. And even on a, on a more kind of you know, IT level, if we manage devices already, um, but we, we use Monkey, we use Jump, you know, we use Jump, the product. Um, but we also at the same time produce value for our users uh, through things like self-service and managed software center. Are we doing okay so far? There's not a lot of movement, so I don't know who's asleep. Or, you know. So now we get to the interesting and messy bit. Okay, platform design principles. Now all of this, you know, how you design, how you design Facebook, how you, how you design, you know, Shopify. Um, the people who came up with this platform didn't just make things up. There are design principles that you can follow and, and do this. So really, what got me thinking about this presentation generally is, can we take some of these principles, basic principles, again, because uh, you know we. I don't even know how much, how much time I've got left, um, and apply them to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is a, a, a very good book, uh, uh, Platform Revolution. I, I think at the minute, out of everything I've, I've, I've read, this is, this is the most succinct and informative one, if you're interested in understanding how platforms work, and also if you're interested in going into designing one. And um, Really what, I mean, you know, this is just a little, a little uh, sentence, but, but it's, it's very important. The design of a platform begins with its core interaction. The core interaction is at the heart of 
uh, everything that that the user will will want to go to your platform to do. Um, it's a set of actions that participants will perform repeatedly to gain value out of the platform. Okay, so for example, do we want them to, when they have a problem, do we want them, or when they want new software, do we want them to go to the service desk, call someone, wait for them to log a call, call gets passed on to second line, passed on to third line, and so on and so forth, or do we want them to go to something like self-service um, without, you know, without having to go all of that. That generates value for the user. Right? That's the core interaction. The value unit underpins that core interaction. And value it, it, in, in platform design um, is, is measured. You can have units. So, for example, you know, installing software and, and you know, or gaining access to resources. Even the, the softer side of things, you know, the, most, the more elusive side of things, like feeling empowered and feeling that you can, you can do this whenever you like, not whenever you know, the machine decides to restart. Um, the, the next thing, uh, well, the other principle is platform roles. Okay, we've decided what we want to do, how we're going to do it, but you know, who does what? So you have, you have roles that are, are fairly defined, not, not set in stone, but you, you, know, you begin by a, a loosely defined set of roles. Um, that need to be interchangeable, and, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll discuss all this in more detail in a second, with examples this time. And finally, uh, we're going back to generativity. Now, ge generativity um, is important. The generative, as opposed to the prescriptive space uh, in a platform, depends on a balance. How open or closed do you want it to be? It doesn't have to be 50-50. It can be 80% open, but there are certain things that you just cannot do, or the other way around. Um, some examples. So we have, for example, a value unit can be, I want to get new software. Now, now, now at this stage, we're, we're fully into device management as a platform. Um, or I want to stay up to date. You know, this is, this is what, what, what I see as being the value for me in participating. Because remember, we have to get them to participate in the first place. Um, or I want to, you know, do perform management tasks that I wouldn't know how to do in the command line, but someone's packaged it all up and has made it available to me to run whenever I want. And equally with security, again, uh, the Beyond Corp model, which I, I intended to include in this presentation, uh, but we, we would be here until tomorrow morning, um, actually fits uh, exactly around this idea of uh, a, a managing, well, a managed environment as a platform. Now, for us at LSE, all of these things, the core interaction for all of these things is one, it's LSE self-service, basically a rebranded version of Jams self-service. Okay, if a user wants to do any of these things, that's where they go. Now, after that, the, the managed side of things can be automated. That's the idea. You define your value unit, you, 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 you build your core interactions, and then you can generate value for yourself as well as the users by automating everything else. Um, you know, you, the, I mean, the, these may be silly examples to, to, to some extent, um, but, but they're, they're here to kind of illustrate the point. You want new software, you go self-service, you get it. After that, um, your device, depending on what it is you got, may do, you know, you, you may be added to lists. For example, we don't install, when we provision, when we deploy devices, we don't install anything other than self-service, and then the, and we, we secure the, uh, the, the client, uh, and after that, the user can choose, for, this is for our staff, the user can choose what to install. Once they install it, however, we keep them up to date through our uh, patch management policies, which are basically a, a combination of Jamf as well as open source tools to get software and push it down to the device in an automated way. Um, you can, uh, in the platform, again, you can automate acting on this new device state to perform other tasks using a combination of attributes, inventory data, and so on. You can take that inventory data and inform other systems, feed other systems. Service, ITSM tools, you know, service desk tools, um, uh, asset management, hardware, software asset management, licensing, and so on. Um, platform roles. Okay, so who does what, basically? Um, with this idea of producers and consumers, um, I I again, it's a difficult concept to grasp. And also, in all fairness, um, it doesn't necessarily, all these platform design principles don't necessarily have to be applied 100% in what it is that we do. I mean, what we do compared to what Facebook wants to do is, is far less complicated and demanding. But you have producers and consumers. The platform provides the infrastructure and the rules for the environment, and 
the, the players um, will shift from role to role. So what you have through the, the value, you know, core interaction, value generation, data exchange, um, you have interaction of these producers and consumers through the platform. And the platform has providers, and these, you know, they don't have to be people, you can have systems. I mean, this is, we're now going into actor network theory, which is a whole different side of information systems. Basically, it says that anything that produces an output is an actor in, in a network, right? And this, this sort of applies here. Uh, and the owner, again, going back to DEP, who owns DEP? Th this isn't a, a very pretty slide, but I, I, I did it very quickly to, to, uh, to illustrate the point. Uh, so we have iPads. We have lots of them. Uh, we have one department, uh, uh, learning technology and innovation, lots of learning technologists. They bought a bunch of iPads that they give out to academics. And they manage them themselves. They're part of our Jump platform. It's, it's split into sites, and I'm going to be showing that in a second. So they manage their own section. And there are others there as well. So say we have an iPad. And um, we are on the other side, we have the platform. We have the platform admins, and that's the space where I operate. We have the site admins, and that's the local team, the LTI team, as well as the central IT support teams that support them and the users. Uh, we have the service desk that use the data from uh, Jamf Pro and they can provide uh, support and advice over the phone and so on. So one of the academics wants an iPad, get in touch with the, the local team. Local team say, yeah, fine. I mean, we use DEP, so as long as it's wiped, they give it to them. The academic goes away, sets it up. It gets a number of profiles. It gets applications that have been predetermined with a pre-stage and so on. Right? Everything that we've, we've seen and we've been seeing in the last couple of years uh, with DP. Now, from that point on, there are more interfaces added to the, uh, to the device. We have the App Store, and we don't lock that down. So if that person has an app that they have purchased and they can use on the device, they, at this stage, they interact with Apple and their core interaction, right? and also self-service. If there's a, an application that we made available for them um, that, that they don't, not everybody needs, but it's relevant to them, they can just go and grab it. That user may need to contact the service desk at any point, at which point, again, the service desk gets informed and uses the platform as a consumer this time. Um, and the same thing with central IT support. And the roles change. The, you know, depending on the situation, you, you either consume the data and the services, the value, or you produce it. Th this is actually a real diagram, and this is from my documentation. I'm a bit OCD with documenting everything and, and you know, having everything neat, right? So my service description document is 7,000 words, um, which, which you know, found yours in, in, an interesting point. Um, and this is effectively, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail. You can't actually see the text at the bottom, uh, which describes the tiers, uh, the, the various tiers. And this is, you know, access and, and, and service. Uh, but the, this is the relationship between, on the left-hand side, we have the system. Um, roles uh, in a full JSS mode and also, uh, you know, site admin, sorry, full admin and site admins. And then on this side, we have actual teams, teams or areas. And this kind of maps the relationship between everything. So, for example, ooh, okay, LTI, which is, you know, the, the guys that, that the site that, uh, that the I iPad went into. Uh, we have LTI iPad support, and you know they manage that. But at the same time, we have the uh, support team, central IT support, also having a relationship. The service desk, sorry, I can't do this. The service desk uh, also uh, uh, feeds into the process by having access to the, uh, uh, the, the platform and so on. So you, you can see how, at scale, this starts becoming complicated, but functional. It's, it's, it, it, you know, it's the, this idea of having a polycentric environment instead of a kind of vertical kind of modular, you know, monolithic, I think is a good word, environment. Um, and the generative space. How do you create, you know, what is it? What are we talking about and how do you create it? Um, generativity is an interesting concept. And, and again, if there's one book that, that you know, you're interested in reading, th this, is, this is it. It's uh, by Jonathan Zitrain, and it's the, the future of the internet and how to stop it. Uh, well <laughs> but basically, he talks about, you know, the internet is the best example of a generative system that we have. Uh, the idea of generativity is that uh, you start with something, but you have unintended, unexpected outcomes through unregulated uh, use. Right? The most generative thing we have, apparently, is the alphabet. We make a series of sounds, and we can speak in I don't know, God knows how many languages. Um, it's the same idea, but how do you apply that in a platform? 
how do you create a generative space that sits between, you know, within that, that balance that you've created between being restrictive and open? The best example, visual example, that uh, I could find is if we compare the top half with the bottom half of that picture. On the top half, we have football, right? And we are tracking the movement of a, of a player in the field. And there are rules here, you know, they can't just do whatever they like. You can't pick up the ball you know, with, with your hands, you can't leave the lines, there's a purpose, there's, there's a core interaction, there's value to be gained, it works. But the players have the freedom, even though there is a game plan, you can see um, times when there were unexpected um, actions that may or may not have led to uh, someone scoring a goal. I mean, we don't know, but you can see the movement. Compare that to foosball, and you can't possibly have that. It still works. You know, it has rules, it has different rules, and maybe they, they are better suited for this sort of game or what it is they're trying to achieve. But there is very little generativity there. Now, in what we do, um, again, another example, and this is a simplified um, uh, use case diagram of our device provisioning and, and, and how we handle encryption and device provisioning after DEP. Okay? So, um, what we have is we begin with, you know, step one up there. Uh, we have a DP enrolled client. We assume it's, it's gone in. The system, Jamf Pro in this case, will determine based on a combination of, again, attributes and inventory data, uh, you know, uh, which pre-stage it was, what site it's in, uh, if we've injected certain attributes that, that you know, we, we decided that we were going to put in there and so on, where it goes. And it, it can take two paths, right? It will either basically proceed with a file vault based encryption um, or not. And within that, it will, uh, if, if we decide to go, oh, no, 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 there we go. If we decide to go down with the encryption, we run our policies and profiles, we build the machine, we put self service in, and then are we setting it up or is this the user doing this at home? If that's the case, we enable the file vault um, um, sort of set of actions. And done, we go to the user. Uh, if not, if we're up, uh, up in uh, uh, section 3B, so if this is a shared machine, um, a, a, computer, a lab machine, or uh, we have most of our student devices are laptops that are shared, um, we can run through a, a series of basically decisions whether or not to bind it to AD, whether or not to bind it to AD and make it uh, and, and install the necessary profiles for the students to log in over Wi Fi with their AD accounts or to leave it. Uh, local uh, and so on. Now, the beginning uh, and the end are the same. But you see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ways of arriving at the same point without being overly uh, open, but without being restrictive at the same time. Does this make sense? Go that was good. So, because we're actually we're actually at the end, right? I'm not. I, I said this is this is an overview. The point is to understand, first of all, that there's something going on, right? Things are changing or have changed. Um, why? Uh, who is it that we, we we cater for? What is it we're talking about when we talk about platforms? And how you know how are they designed? What are the basic principles? There's, the, there are other design principles and, and design approaches that go into a lot more detail, but. You know, th this isn't the, the, the time or place. And, and this is, this is the, the last quote, and, and to be honest, my favorite one. Uh, and William McDonough is, is one of those uh, pioneers in green architecture. And it, what he said, which, which again is very profound, that the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. Okay? We still have stones. But it ended because we, we, we progressed. We found either needs or we, we found possibilities, we identified possibilities, and we acted on them. And again, um, uh, you know, backed up by information systems theory, and you saw the graphs and everything, right? We are at, at, at that point. And, and I think this approach is certainly working for us, and I think it can work very well for, um, uh, well, device management in other places going forward. So who is the least confused and can ask a question? I think we have five minutes.
No? Do you want to go to the pub? <laughs> I, I speak faster when I have the beer. You know? So, with this new kind of workflow and this new kind of ideology of provisioning, say, machines in uh, an enterprise environment, um, now imaging's going away. What are you finding the fastest way to provision a machine? Um, because when you used to do like Netboot, it used to be quite quick. Like 20 minutes you could get a machine up and running. In, in my testing, it's actually taken quite a long time, mm. considerably. And what have you found um, through this way of, you know, when you have to repurpose a machine, what what's have you found the fastest way? Patience is what I found. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, uh, we, we, have, we have a problem. And the problem is that we are at the stage where because both technologies are still you know, running, or both, say, technological paradigms are still alive, we will be comparing the new with the old. Okay, we can't get away from that. Um, what we have done, <laughs> and, and we d when I started at LSE, I was told, um, how about we don't image anything? like four years ago, four and a half years ago, uh, before DEP was available in the UK, but it was announced. Because uh, in my previous place, we, we stopped imaging and we were going towards web enrollment, you know, quick ads, um, uh, browser-based enrollment, that sort of stuff. And, and we thought, okay, you know, we'll do it. We, we weighed the pros and cons. The cons were, um, it was not gonna be as, as fast or as automated as we'd like. But also, at the same time though, we had, because at LSE there were 80 Apple devices 50 Macs and 30 iPads uh, four and a half years ago, and we now have 2,000, right? So what we had was uh, an untrained Windows-based IT environment, IT support. So what we thought is, let's try, see if, and also, you know, this came from the IT support guys. They said, we'd rather be a bit more hands-on than you automate everything for us through, you know, network imaging at the time, effectively, um, and, and see if it works. And to be honest, we haven't had that discussion since. Uh, people have moved up in the technical ability and, and also in how engaged they are with the, the kind of running things from the back end, as it were, and, um, and, and it's worked well. But what we have to sacrifice is that, that speed. So you lose, you lose that bit, but you gain, again, in a multi-sided way. You know? that, that's the answer. There is, there is no silver bullet here. So first of all, well done for the talk. Uh, I think it was a great, great talk. Um, and you do a lot of research and analysis. Um, how do you get time to manage your Macs? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no, no. Good point. Very good point. Um, again, you, well, we, don't, we don't really have an organizational structure here, but what I don't do and what I try not to do is get involved to the point where I am actually uh, on a machine fixing individual problems. Like my, my role is to... to provide the framework and the automation. So focus. The vision. Ah, you look, I mean, we can, we can find words, but that, that's the idea. So if there is a problem that, is, that I, I see, because I have the overall view, that I see as a repeatable problem, we automate it and we get it out of the way. And at the same time, we try and, and, and strike this balance between, okay, how much do we want the users to be involved in this? I mean, you don't want, this is, the idea here is not to give someone a laptop and say, bye, see you in five years when you buy a new one. That's, that's not the point. The point is to, again, align ourselves with where things are very clearly going or have gone, and at the same time, try and maintain the same level, if not better, of you know, management, coherence, and, and, and sort of granularity, if you like, um, while allowing <coughs> participation, and, and in fact, enabling participation. Cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.